Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for joining me for Lead Time Chats. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about um, some a topic that I know you're, you have a lot of expertise on, which is how startups can actually hire better. And Jen, I know you've been a startup advisor, you run a recruiting boot camp, and um, perhaps a lot of people know you as a prolific tweeter on <laughs> all things uh, tech related and tech culture related. Um, so maybe to start us off, could you like, I mean, I know there's a lot of things going on with hiring right now. People, you know, there's a lot of um, the, the great resignation. I hear it's a really intense hiring market out there. Um, maybe to start us off, you can just kind of paint us a picture of like what's going on with hiring and hiring in startups right now. Yeah, I mean, unless you've been living under a rock, um, <laughs> not in quarantine. Um, yeah, you've heard the news stories, you've seen the headlines about just how bonkers it is out there. I feel like the pandemic's really created this opportunity for us to look at how corporations, you know, really look at talent. Mm -hmm. It's created this big disruption that none of us expected, but in some ways, you know, I think it was overdue. So a lot of people who were disappointed, for example, by their company's uh, you know, crisis responses, or even to last summer's Black Lives Matter movement, people mm -hmm. are realizing, wait, there is just way more choice out there in this market. There are companies that will fight for you, the talent, more than uh, maybe your kind of current company has. So mm -hmm. we're seeing that not only everywhere per the great resignation, but I also think that it's a particularly interesting time for startups. You know, the, the market is really interesting. After kind of the uncertainty of last year, it feels like hiring goals, growth plans are just like <laughs> out of control. <laughs> Maybe because we, you know, had like a lot of layoffs and uncertainty, hiring uh, freeze bu bu uh, budgets were frozen for a while, right? Yeah. But then maybe like about a year ago, last fall, things started really picking back up. And I think companies realized, well, not only do we need to grow in 2021 as we normally would, we actually want to make up for maybe growth that we didn't have in 2020. Mm. So yeah, it feels like the landscape is just really, really competitive. Um, mm -hmm. And that means that whenever it's competitive like this, the power really shifts to the candidates. It's a candidate-centered mm -hmm. market. And this is where companies can really create an advantage by investing in their hiring, actually figuring out how to be good at it. And by good at it, I mean, not just throwing money at it, because that is not the same thing as actually developing the skill. And that's gonna end up creating an advantage for potentially years to come. Maybe this ends up being the make it or break it for your company. What are some of the, I have so many questions. Okay, maybe we'll start with <laughs> what are some of the common mistakes that you see startups making in this market or, or just in hiring in general? Well, so yeah, I, I've especially focused on early stage uh, hiring. So, you know, I truly have no other hobbies but thinking about hiring all day long. So <laughs> I do care about it at all different contexts, but I really focus on that startup hiring. And I can go into so many reasons why it's broken, it's perpetually broken, it's so chronic, but I can, I'll pull out a couple different things. So let's say you are an engineer who came from a larger company, the Googles, mm -hmm. the Facebooks of the world. You get some kind of seed funding that you're excited to hire, kind of beyond like the first like three friends you're able to hire, you know, through a personal word of mouth or what's up. Now it's time to like actually grow. So the thing is, most of us have a certain level of exposure to hiring. Like we've all, most mm -hmm. of us have had interviews on, on both sides, but that's actually a very limited uh, kind of cycle of the entire hiring process. Yeah. So something that I end up teaching a lot through my, you know, recruiting bootcamp courses is that hiring is just like a product. It is an end-to-end -end experience that you need to think about. Um, and I don't say that to add a lot of pressure, like it is okay to take an MVP approach. You know, you figure out what works for you when you're 10 people, 50, 100 and adapt. But the really common mistake I see a lot of startup founders kind of making is that the only parts of hiring they were exposed to when they were bigger companies is interviewing, right? Right. Canada show up, your job is to interview, you know, look at their resume and like, oh, good enough. And then <laughs> they show up. I'm sorry, is that not what happens? <laughs> it is, uh-huh. But 
we forget to kind of take for take into account is there's actually a whole infrastructure, sometimes like mm-hmm. invisible to the average IC employee. So there's not only kind of like the HR processes, but there's also the company brand. If you're mm-hmm. the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, you know, you're not really having to like pull in people as much as people are coming to you because of right. your existing company brand, which is separate from your employer brand that are very much related. So when you are a 5%, 10% startup, you're like, all right, it's time to hire. Let's go interview people. Where are they? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> because they used to be hand delivered to you by the recruiting teams, right. by all this the massive infrastructure. Other function. <laughs> It turns out they were doing things the whole, the whole time. <laughs> I know. So there's this moment of realization around like, oh, I need to build it. Yes, mm-hmm. you, you the founder. So there are a lot of things that you can do um, to really kind of just, again, figure out like, you know, everything that you saw at the Googles to Facebook, the Facebooks of the world are not going to be a- rep- applicable to you yet. But I'll give a couple mm-hmm. of examples. So, you know, this sounds boring, but job descriptions really Mm -hmm. investing time to get the job description right is a huge green flag and actually just an advantage when you're trying to hire candidates. So Mm -hmm. let's say, you know, you are looking for a job and you're an engineer, you like open up like 20 different startups, uh, careers pages, and you're kind of just like comparing all of them. And that's, that's that stage kind of like, you know, how much difference are there, how much difference does exist between all these startups and their offerings, like not much, right? Like mm-hmm. they can all have the same, like, oh, this is our mission. These are our benefits, but really the, you know, what is that phrase? Oh no, I try to make a, the proof is in the pudding. Is mm-hmm. that a phrase? Okay. You, you get I think so. <laughs> so when you are on the candidate side and like looking at all these job descriptions, you can tell which companies are thinking critically about what role, you know, what, what needs do they have? Why do they need this? Uh, what business function does it serve? What qualifications looking for? Whereas a company that's kind of phoning it in or really treats this as a chore, mm-hmm. these are the horrible job descriptions that everyone hates. Mm-hmm. But to the candidate, it's funny because when we write job descriptions on the company side, we, we treat it as a, we're just like, oh, I just don't wanna do this, like get this away from me, which is why terrible job descriptions happen. Mm-hmm. But from the candidate side, they are looking for information, not only just like what the actual job is, but the level of effort that a company puts into a document like this is directly correlated with what an employee experience you'll have. Yeah. Is this a type of company that actually cares about employee experience? Is it investing in the right things, the people side, not just the, you know, um, building the product and growth at all costs. I think this is really starting to emerge as a differentiator. And it's something that the founders are really having to realize because pitching your company to investors pitch, versus pitching your comp- uh, company as a potential workplace are actually mm-hmm. very different skill sets. They're very different mindsets. And I'm sorry, but you cannot get away with just promising, you know, Candidates that have a world of options just based on confidence and projections. You actually mm-hmm. have to show, here's how we're thinking about it. Here's how we care about culture. Here's how we're re- prepared to invest in our employees' careers. Mm-hmm. I um, re- that reminds me, I recently took a look at someone's, um, a friend of mine was like, hey, I'm hiring for a VPE. Like, do you, do you know anyone? Uh, he sent me the job description and I had like a very visceral reaction to it. So I just like made, I was like, can you send this in a commentable form? Cause I need to like share this with you, but it was very interesting. I have some work to do on this document. I was like, would you like some feedback? Oh, I did ask him first, but it was things like, um, this is a VPE role for like a, you know, maybe 20 engineers already. And it said like, Mm -hmm. here are the responsibilities. And there were like five bullet points. And one of them was like, conduct one-on-ones with, employees. And I was like, that's a given. Like the fact that you have to put it there is a red flag that like, who knows what's going on at this company that like you need to specify as one of the five bullet points that your responsibilities have one-on-one. So I was like, maybe get rid of that and like focus on like, you know, growing your employees and supporting their personal development or career development. Um, and then there was another, it was another thing I forgot. Yeah. There was, oh, it was like, there was one that was like, 
assign and like spec out tickets for junior engineers. And I was like, if I saw that as a VPE, I would be yeah. like, there's something really weird going on at this company. So even the things that are like, like what's not said, but what they kind of imply, I feel mm-hmm. like are really revealing. But it was interesting mm-hmm. for me to read read it as like, you know, a potential, like someone he kind of like in the in the bucket of like potential candidates I was like, we should probably fix these up. And then, cause these are things that, the things that give me like a really big red flag of like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, seems like something's fishy, something fishy is happening here. <laughs> Well, first of all, send them to boot camp, but I will happily <laughs> whip them up into shape. I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, that is a great example of how sometimes we write these documents and we're not able to really just like by ourselves think about how this will be perceived or interpreted, right? Right. So this is what I mean by sounds boring, but such high ROI because something like a job description, your careers pages, your interviewer training, it's such low hanging fruit. Like, oh my God. Mm. <laughs> like. The thing about recruiting is um, we need to think about false positives and false negatives, Mm -hmm. okay? So there are the kind of errors in that sometimes you make a mishire, right? Those are the false positives and those are felt pretty quickly and they can be really painful because especially when you're on a small team, you know, you have someone who's just like not working. Everyone's kind of just like, ha, this is terrible. The thing about tricky, the the tricky thing about recruiting though, is we actually have a ton of false negatives Mm. and we never know about it. Yeah. So when you put up a job description that you were never taught how to do well, or you just like didn't put the right effort in, how do you know which candidates are closing the tab on you and just never even applying who would have been a fantastic candidate for you? How do you know Mm -hmm. that? You don't. So there's a way that, you know, the traditional kind of recruiting processes are very much optimized for, you know, unsurprisingly, like a very traditional HR mindset, right? Like minimize risk, like keep out all these like bad apples and like never let them in. And we don't think enough about, um, you know, really think of our, thinking of ourselves as marketers and how do we attract mm-hmm. the right people in? Who are we inadvertently turning away? Who could be really game changers on our team? And we just never found out. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Um, I'm curious, you know, from the, the kind of candidate side, what are you seeing that people are, I mean, people are obviously looking around for jobs a lot these days, but like, what do you, is there any patterns on what they're looking for? Like, especially with startups, are people less risk tolerant or are you seeing the same kinds of like people are willing to go into early stage startups or are they looking more for like the, you know, several hundred people multi-series um, like ra- have raised se- a few series of uh, fun- funds? Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult to like pinpoint exactly since everyone's always going to have different things they're prioritizing. Um, you know, some people who are default really excited about early stage, maybe like, yeah, it's because of the pandemic, they now kind of want to try a little bit more stability. Um, but the opposite could be try- could be happening as well, where I think the pandemic really um, has been a period of forced introspection for everybody. (laughs) You know, you're just like literally confronted with disasters and mortality. And I think a lot of people are also really hungry for meaningful work. I think a lot of people are kind of realizing, wait, this actually is a time to take a risk if, you know, they're in a place to do so. So Mm -hmm. it's hard to pinpoint exactly like, um, you know, is there more of this, less of that. But I do think, you know, I love being in the tech industry. I really do. Even though sometimes it can be a little bit of a love-hate relationship. I got Jen's tweets for more more insights there. (laughs) I don't talk about that every day or anything. Um, But yeah, I, I, you know, one of the parts I really love is just the opportunity and how there's always exciting new things to work on. And I think we're at a stage where companies are realizing they have to step up their game. They're not entitled to talent just because they raise a certain amount of money and, you know, the founders have a certain pedigree. It's like, okay, you know, there's 30 other startups in this category that can have similar offerings. I really believe that this kind of a third skill, you know, there's one building the great product two you know, being able to build a really solid business around it, go to market. 
The third advantage is going to be around building culture, leadership, management, all these people things that I think for so long we've, in our industry, we looked at it as a luxury, like, no, we'll worry about that later. No, yeah. we got to start now. This, this has become a requirement. Yeah. I, as someone who has recently <laughs> ramped up hiring, um, I will say I was a bit intimidated to, you know, start looking in this market, but I, I am hopeful. My reframing is that people are more clear about what they want, right? Mm-hmm. Like you used to, you used to see a bit of like, um, or at least I remember being at startups and we'd get people, we make offers and then, you know, it'd be like, you know, a 20 person startup and like, oh, you know, I just, I just couldn't turn down the Facebook offer. Like the, you know, the comp was just too good. And like, hopefully people will have figured that out because the comp is going to be even better on that end. Like the base salary, the whatever, all those things are going to be just like super competitive with all the other large companies that can afford it. And so the people who are actually applying to the startups will have already maybe done that introspection of like, yeah. I want to be at a startup because X, Y, and Z, and they're not going to then be like, we're going through the interview process. And at the end, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I was just interviewing around and now I'm going to go to Facebook, Google, whatever the large companies are that are, you know, really paying a lot. Yeah. They get to, you know, drop this big number. <laughs> And we're just like, well, all right, good try. Good job, everybody. Uh, we gave our best effort. So a yeah. couple of tips around this that, once again, you know, I talk a lot about in bootcamp, but preview. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I really emphasize in startups the importance of motivation fit. Mm-hmm. So that is a separate category of evaluation for candidates, kind of that finding the mutual fit, you know, from the skills fit. You know, can they actually do the job? Do they have the technical skills, whatnot? Uh, motivation fit is something that, you know, at big companies, they just like don't care as much because we are building a machine and here's how you can fit it and you'll be very well compensated for it. Startups, so very different. You do need some level of motivation fit that the candidate is bringing to you. Like they, that's already existing within them and your job is to figure out how to kind of best match it. So one thing I used to do when I was kind of, you know, in the trenches with recruiting is pretty early on in the process, I try to gauge motivation fit. And it's one of those things like you can't quite ask, like, what is your motivation? Because Mm -hmm. very motivated, Jen, I'm very motivated. (laughs) You know, my biggest weakness is I'm too motivated, actually. Um, (laughs) I work too hard. (laughs) So I might ask something like, you know, like, okay, because there's like the recruiter screen or whatnot. Um, Yeah, like, just curious in your current job search, which companies besides us are you most excited about? Mm. You know, if you're able to tell me what kind of companies are you applying to, what are you most excited about? And from their answer, the it'll be so revealing because if they were telling me like, oh, you're you know 20 person startup, but I'm also most excited about Facebook and Google and so on, I'll be like, oh, okay. To me, that tells me there might not be a motivation fit because exactly as you said, we could go down the entire interview process, think a ton of hours into it. And they'll just win with a bigger offer. Right. And that's that like cost is nothing to a big company, but that could be like hours of a CEO's time, hours of a, you know, VP of engineers, engineering's time, which is like super valuable when your company is like 20 people. I mean, it is truly bonkers, kind of similar to like false negatives. The number of hours we spend on recruiting, the number of literally like, you know, we can divide up, do the math and salaries, Mm -hmm. astronomical. But we don't look at actually like, was this time efficient? Um, did mm. it make sense for us to move people through these stages when the motivation fit wasn't right from the beginning? Mm. So really gauging that um, in the beginning and you know, just asking a little bit around it can tell you a lot about how much time to invest in that person and whatnot. Or maybe they just need a further conversation, right? Because they, they're allowed to say, I'm early in my process. I'm still figuring it out. That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, it really is just uh, the how that's um, important. And that just only can be discovered through conversation. Yeah. I had a, a screen last week that like the first thing we talked about was like, and the person brought it up was risk appetite. Just like he'd never mm-hmm. been in a startup. And I was like, great. I'm so glad we're talking about this because yeah. it was pretty clear within like 15 minutes, it wasn't a good fit. I was like, great. Mm-hmm. We didn't waste, like, I didn't waste your time. You didn't waste my time. Like maybe down the road we'll work together, but Love not that. right now. Right. 
yeah and that's i think one of the fun parts of recruiting for me now that i've been doing this for quite a few years is the way i get to connect with people long term right even if it's not this job this position um maybe when the company's bigger or even even if i'm at my next venture um Mm -hmm. the thing about recruiting is that it really is about relationships and doing those well at scale and they might not show up in terms of like filling this but in this seat right now, but mm-hmm. hey, who knows what's going on? Yeah. Um, what was I gonna ask you? Well, I have I have a question for you from okay. I, I forgot what I was gonna ask you, but maybe it'll come up again. But I do have a question that was posted to me anonymously Ooh, or um, from a, a Twitter follow of yours. The question is um, something that is happening a lot in tech hiring, but isn't really talked about much is Mm -hmm. back channel. So Mm -hmm. how to do back channel? Well, um, it feels, I don't know. I feel like there's some, I I'm not too close to, but like, it feels like, oh, you shouldn't do it, but because there's like bias involved, but if you're like one degree, like if you've worked with someone who's worked with this person, like, it seems like pretty inevitable that you're going to be like, Hey, how is your experience working with this person in even a pretty casual way? Um, so do you have any advice on like how to do this in a way that feels fair to the candidate and it's not, you know, doesn't have like any ickiness? I have a lot of thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, I think this is a really good example of things that I do feel like the startup specific context does make for a different kind of answer than talking about hiring in general. I think the points that this person is bringing up, they are really good considerations. Mm -hmm. I also think that early stage hiring is different where you're working with people on such a more like close level. Yeah. Like another example would be like people always hear like, oh, if you want more diversity, like you shouldn't rely on referrals. You know, referrals are tend to be very homogeneous. And that's definitely true in some ways. But I cannot, (laughs) no one can tell startups early stage teams, like, oh, you're not allowed to use referrals, right? (laughs) It's just like, how's that going to work? So I think once again, we need to think about kind of the context and really the how is what matters. So I think a lot of the issues are very much real. Um, When we overuse back channels, they tend to open up bias for sure. People from underrepresented backgrounds tend to have, you know, maybe judgments on their performance that wasn't really about their performance, but about some sort of bias. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely see how then that can, um, you know, disadvantage certain groups. And that's something that you can take into account. Yeah. I also think that, you know, back channels that startups tend to be overused because going at full circle, because companies haven't actually learned how to hire well yet, because they haven't actually Mm. confidently figured out how to do their own evaluation, their own, how do we define the business need and then learn how to like actually evaluate people against it. By the time you get to the offer stage, they're just like, we still don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is why we keep going back to back channels. Mm. So my, my solution is There is a time and place where back channels can be useful. Absolutely. Especially if you can do it in a way that's, you know, there, there's a close relationship. There is room for nuance and kind of being able to filter appropriately, but back channels, reference, reference calls will never be a substitute for actually running the entire hiring process effectively. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So being really clear about like, what answers are you getting answered or what questions are you getting answered by the back channel? And you know, what does that say exactly. about your process, right? If you're getting to the end of the process and you're needing a back channel um, and you you have no other real assessment of this candidate, that may be a, a, a strong signal that you need to revamp your, your process. Right, it's like, because we still don't know enough information, even though we finished in every process, let's just go find other people's judgments, right. which are yeah. probably very biased. And this is why I also tell people with reference checks, for example, If you are doing reference checks and you're still not sure, like, who should we hire? We're doing that wrong. Mm. To me, reference checks are to, you know, verify the information that you've already gathered from the actual interview process. And Mm. maybe, you know, like you have down to like two finalists and you're just like excited about either of them and 
maybe their reference check end up being kind of nudging one over the other, and that's fantastic. But yeah, I would say to startups and this person, it's like, if you find yourself kind of like over relying on reference checks and these on a like later stage, that usually means we need to go all the way to the beginning, really look at, you know, um, headcount planning, job description, employer brand, interview training, like all these things, like they can mm-hmm. be tackled in turn, but yeah, trying to do things at the end makes this so much harder. Well, also it, it, I mean, it brings us back to the, the tip you were sharing about motivation fit, right? Like there's things you can do to screen out and save yourself that whole, whatever, 20 hours or however long your team is spending on hiring someone or getting to the, you know, offer stage. Are there any other things like that, that you see companies doing wrong, like screening for motivation fit, um, things that you can do upfront that would save startups a ton of time? Yeah. So many things. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I really am such a huge advocate for employer branding. Mm -hmm. And that can sound a little bit intimidating. Like what is, what actually is that? And, you know, I'm really talking some like simple MVP things. So again, I'll, I'll save the spiel for bootcamp, which I like go into a whole day about, but um, really thinking of ourselves as marketers. Mm -hmm. So not just kind of like receiving candidates and evaluating them, but how do we tell maybe unique stories about our opportunities, our company? How do we showcase what makes things interesting? How do we maybe make the mission come alive? Maybe do some Mm. storytelling around why did current employees join? So something I really encourage around is like some basic, simple content. Mm -hmm. You don't have to commit to like a full, you know, huge project blog post. It can literally just be a medium post, it can be, you know, tweets, it can be just a really good job description, it can be your career site. But even going back to your friend, um, and his example about, uh, you know, what they're doing, something that I always encourage companies to do is put a little bit of like an investigative hat and look at what are the existing things that you currently do that internally people like, Great. So now let's just like put some words onto paper, maybe a photo or screenshot, and let's start putting it out there. So maybe this person just like really does the best one-on-ones ever. You know, maybe (laughs) this company just like rules at one-on-ones. Cool. Can we just like get a little bit more specific? Can we pull tease out like a story or two? Can we get like an employee quote about what is it that makes one-on-ones at this company special? If you're able mm-hmm. to just produce like a simple content, it, it could even be like a LinkedIn post. We've had a lot of bootcamp alumni have success with LinkedIn posts where people see them, they bring them up in interviews and they say they really like them. Mm-hmm. Um, you're actually really, really making content work for you. So people, mm-hmm. by the time they're applying, by the time you're interviewing them, you're getting them more excited about your opportunities. So you can do less time kind of trying to like sell verbally, trying to give the same spiel. Yeah. Um, you know, you've done that many times. I've done it. But a little bit of investment into content and employer branding can go, oh, so good. <laughs> awesome. Um, I know you've put a lot of effort and time into building out your recruiting boot camp. Do you want to just share a little bit about who it's for and what people get out of it? Yeah, for me, you know, hopefully it's not too like idealistic sounding, but I just really care about hiring. I think it's like such a big leverage to build a great company, solve the world's biggest problems, Mm -hmm. like be a vehicle for people's personal growth and fulfillment. So I'm a a giant nerd like that. So the bootcamp program is for startups uh, to gather. So we've had all the way from founders, um, you know, we just had on our most recent cohort, of someone who just literally a team of one, um, an engineer turned founder who's like, no, I just really want the great foundation from day one. So he's come before he hires a single employee to founders of larger companies. We've had hiring managers of all different, you know, heads of marketing, product managers, chief of staff, ops managers, and also very experienced recruiters, new recruiters. All of us have come together to really talk about recruiting in a way that makes sense and actually, you know, it's not stupid. <laughs> but it's just like <laughs> the corporate kind of like traditional mindset about recruiting. It's a chore. It's something that we just have to do. Everyone hates it. But for me, I'm nervous because 
I actually think it's really fun when you do it right. Mm -hmm. I love getting to know people. I love getting to, you know, fill roles with the people that are like perfect in ways that you couldn't even have predicted, but they end up, you know, joining and just like absolutely killing it. And you can't imagine the company without this person. And you get to multiply that by a hundred. So mm -hmm. that's what bootcamp is all about. We're also a very community-based course. So there's a lot of breakouts, sharing for people to kind of come in and, you know, talk about honestly their challenges, yeah. um, a lot of training each other. And we have a ongoing community of, you know, exclusive Slack. Uh, we have uh, follow-up uh, learning groups for me to kind of gather my community and just rant at them some more about <laughs> ways you can get better at recruiting. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I've had friends who are looking around as part of this, you know, great resignation. And I just, all I want is to play, like find somewhere. I'm like, let me go ask, let me go ask my friend who's a VPE. Like we're not hiring for that role, but like, mm -hmm. I don't know, there's this desire to like connect people to the right, like a good fit. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like a matchmaking desire, <laughs> but, but I, I can totally understand that. Um, and so yeah, thank you so much for joining. Um, this was really, really, really fantastic. And just hearing all your expertise and hiring and, and all your tips and hearing about your, your boot camp. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Always so fun to talk to you. So great to do. So great to be part of this podcast.